Uh, the just by way of just a quick segue into what we're talking about. We basically affirmed for the last three weeks that the, that the church is a people, and it is a people on a mission together. And it is a people on a mission that's made up of individuals sitting in the pew, sitting in the chairs, okay, that come together corporately. So you cannot just think corporately uh, so that you blend into this corporate thing and have no personal responsibility. Does that make sense to you? In other words, this corporate church, this body of gathered, assembled people uh, is made up of individuals. So you've got to think of, uh, of what that means for you as an individual. As you sit here, as you sit here, what does that mean for you? Uh, one of the more important points that I mentioned was that uh, you know, we, we gather corporately for personal worship, expressed corporately. We, we, gathered, uh, we gather for personal proclamation of the gospel to be empowered corporately. And we gather for the personal pursuit of obedience to Christ to be encouraged corporately. But you need to think of personal worship, personal proclamation, and your own personal pursuit of the obedience to Christ. We, 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 we can't have the mindset that says, okay, I'm part of a church and Christians in general should be doing these things. But I myself won't be. <laughs> you know what I mean? These are good Christian things to do um, for someone else to do. And I agree with them, yet I don't do them. We've got to be careful that we embrace. If we say that these are things that we embrace, that the Bible does, te uh, does in fact teach us, then we need to embrace personal, on a personal level, everyone. So that means I, uh, as, a, as a personal per um as an individual, I should say, in this body, uh, just though I'm the primary proclaimer here uh, publicly or in our setting, uh, I need to be personally striving for worship. And where does worship happen? Happens in the heart. Okay, happens in the heart, and worship is expressed out the mouth, or if you dance, or if you move, or you stand, or you close your eyes and you sway. Whatever you do. Uh, worship can be expressed a million different ways. It can be expressed in art and in music and in writing and all many different things. But worship happens in the heart. So let me ask you a question. Do you personally pursue real and genuine adoration of God from on the heart level? Or do you struggle? To, does your heart struggle to catch up with what your mouth is singing when we sing hymns? You struggle there. Um, you got to work hard for that. Are you worshiping at home all through the week, through the good, through the bad, through the ugly? Uh, do you worship God corp, uh, at personal on a personal level? And bring that mentality of worship here so that I might experience you worshiping alongside me. And you get to experience me worshiping. That's what this corporate nature of the church is all about. So That's a big deal. Uh, and I'm stressing this personal uh, note because that leads us really to... The mission that we are gathered here for. You see, if we say that God has now saved me from hell, and that's the end of what God is doing, so now I'm not going to hell, so God's done with me, he's got me, now he's going to go on to the next person, so all I do from now on is I just kind of come and do my church thing, and I wait till I go to heaven. We've missed the whole point of what God's doing, and we've said, and I made it clear over the past weeks, that the mission is... Uh, or the mission is to make disciples or to seek worshipers. But now what we want to talk about is we want to ask the question, how does God do that, number one? And number two, and, and you can answer that by asking, how did God do it in your life? Okay. And then number two, um, what should be happening as a result of God's uh, moving and working in the life of a person? And where do you fit in? Where do you as a person, an individual, fit in in that plan? Okay. So, let's talk quickly about the simplicity of the structure of a church. So, the church then is uh, a gathered people, gathered people, individually pursuing God together. I just said that. Secondly, that gathered people, we said last week, is to be a, uh, to be a reflection and a proclamation of the gospel. Uh, remember in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, it says, If our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. How is God displaying his glory for all to see? How does he put his glory? How awesome and glorious God is. How does he help us to see that? Answer, he became a man. 
Jesus was the very icon, the very image of God. Everything that God is, Jesus was in bodily form. So that's how we can see God's glory. John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and then it goes on to say, and we beheld his glory. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. You want to know how beautiful God is? You know, no one's ever seen God, have they? Have you ever seen God? Not at all. He's a spirit. He's not a man that he should be seen. So what happened? He became a man so that he might, might be seen by men. God might declare his glory. But how does he do it? How does he make himself look? Do we just look at Jesus and say, oh, that's glorious hair. I really like your hair, Jesus. Or, hey, Jesus, uh, you know, I really like the fact that you're a Nazarene. Or, really cool shoes, Jesus. Is, is that what, how God is displaying um, how glorious he is? And the answer is no. It has nothing to do. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus had no form or outward appearance that he was even attracted. I'm losing all attention. Focus, man. Focus. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the teacher in me. Come on. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm talking. I see everybody. Don't leave. Don't leave that. Okay. All right. You're fine. Uh, <laughs> detention. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to detention. Uh, you can hold the baby back there. Uh, she's like, yeah, let me do it. <laughs> um, where was I? I forgot. Oh. What is it so glorious about God becoming a man? What, what makes that so beautiful? And, and the answer is God reveals himself in his actions. In, in the Old Testament, God provided for Abraham a substitutionary sacrifice. So Abraham didn't have to kill his son. So uh, Abraham, through his tears, through his pain, was obeying God. And then he was about to slay his own son when God says, stop it. And then there's a ram over in the thicket over here. It says, and God provides a substitute. And Abraham takes that ram, takes his son gladly off the altar, replaces it with the substitute that God provided himself, and said, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. Abraham saw the beauty of God as a provider, a fully dependable provider, and particularly the provider of a satisfactory substitute. That would fulfill God's commands. Who was that substitute? Jesus. That was a picture of Jesus. And so here you should get the picture of God laying his son Jesus on the altar. That is the cross. And there God the father slaying his own son as the substitute. Because we should be the ones God should be slaying on that altar. But Jesus, God, the Father, offers his Son as a substitutionary sacrifice. That's beautiful, y'all. The fact that God became a man and then bore our sins in his body as a man so that he might redeem us, that God-man might bring us to him. We just sang about it. That's beautiful. So that means God's glory then is not just being displayed in the physical form, but in what he does as a man. And what does he do? He lays down his life for sinners. And that statement, Jesus died for sinners, is the gospel. It is good news. And that is glorious. That being said then, God's glory is put on display as two things happen in your life. It's really hard because I don't have a big group. So if I look like I'm picking on you because I'm just looking your way a lot or looking your way a lot, I'm not, I have a, sometimes I'll just close my eyes because I don't know who to look at. Okay, So that's what I'm doing. I don't want you to think I'm preaching at you. I just It's a small group. So I'm going to be looking at the same people a lot. Okay, So I feel uncomfortable doing that to you. I want you to think anything. So there's my segue into uh, what I'm about to say. So... That means for you as an individual, God is going to display his son through your life as you live out obedience to the gospel. What are the, what are the demands? The Bible, the Bible says that we should obey the gospel. Now, if we have to obey the gospel, that means that the gospel demands something. Isn't it true that we normally think, no, 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 we believe the gospel, right? Not the way we normally think about it. Well, Paul says, yes. Whoever believes the gospel, 
But he also says, if you believe, you will obey the gospel as well. In fact, he says, everyone who has not obeyed the gospel will not see life, but the wrath of God will abide on him. John, that's Jesus actually speaking, John 3.36. So what does it mean to obey the gospel? Well, Jesus often said, I have forgiven you, therefore what, what's the demand of receiving forgiveness? What is, the, what is the demand? You have been forgiven, now forgive. I have loved you, now love. I have given you grace and mercy, now go bestow it. The demand of the gospel, then, is a reflection of the very character of God being revealed on the cross as he now gives you commands to go out and do, the, do likewise. Jesus says, whoever loves me, he will keep my what? Keep my commands. And what are the commands? To love. Love enemies, love brothers, love neighbors, love God. Love. All the commands are one word, love. In God is love, and he reveals his character through love, particularly the greatest love, laying down your life uh, for believers. So that means that God intends to display the gospel in your life. Do you wonder why life is hard and you have to deal with difficult people all the time? You ever wonder why that is? What, what's what's the, the answer? The Bible answer is, so that through those difficult people, you might love, forgive, give grace, give mercy, so that you might, to that person, display the glory of Christ in your body as you display and obey the gospel. That's what I call a reflection of the gospel. I did not die on the cross, but I can do actions and obey God's command that reflect his character. You see, the moon doesn't have its own light, does it? No, the sun shines on the moon, and the moon reflects the, the light of the sun dimly. We are the moon, and the sun, S-O-N, is shining through us. This is 2 Corinthians 4. This is what I preached last week. I said I wasn't going to do it. I did it anyway. That's okay. <laughs> I'm laying foundation for what I'm about to say. Um, so 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, Let there be light, he is now shining in our hearts. Why? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What's got God? What does God want to let everybody see? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And where do we see it? He goes on to say, in the face of Jesus. Where does God show the light of the knowledge of his glory? In the face of Jesus. But where is he shining? For God who said, let there be light, is now shining in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So where is God shining? In you, so that you might just put Jesus on display for all to see. That's a reflection of the gospel. But this Jesus isn't, I don't just say, hey, watch my life and you'll, you'll learn all about Jesus. Because if you watch my life too long, you'll learn all about why Jesus died too. True? So we, we only get a dim reflection of the cross as I live. So my life can't save you. you, you someone says, yeah, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. I get what that person is saying, but I, I don't like the quote. Because the gospel is designed not just to be reflected, though that is what God's commands are, a reflection of his nature and his character. The glory of God being shown in a very physical way. Okay, So we should obey the gospel. But the gospel is designed to be proclaimed. Proclaimed by who? Uh, you. <laughs> and you, and you, and you. Everyone. Oh, no, Jim, I'm not a good speaker. I don't care. God is First Corinthians chapter 1. God didn't choose wise people to share the gospel. In fact, he's chosen the foolishness of preaching the gospel to save those that believe. Can you say Jesus died for your sins? Can you say those words? And he is your only hope of heaven. Can you say those words? Now, why are those words hard to say? They're not hard words, are they? Anyway, it takes no scholar to say that. It doesn't, a child can get that. Jesus says so. You can receive him as a child. I, as a six-year-old, embraced. I love what Jesus did for me. I was like, Jesus died for me, so I don't have to go to hell. He saved me from my sins and from hell, and I get to be with him forever because of what he did. That's amazing. As a six-year-old, I liked what I heard. Anybody else like that? You remember that as a young child? A child can understand that and love it. It takes no scholar. But we use that as an excuse. Well, I'm not smart. I don't know how to. 
Do you know why we struggle with it? It's because we're fearful. Because to say to a Muslim, Jesus is your only hope, Allah can't help you. That's very offensive, isn't it? But to say to a Jew, you got it all wrong. You rejected Jesus. You killed Jesus. And he was your hope. To say that, that's very offensive. To say to a girl who, who asks you a question, this actually happened to me. My grandmother died, and she didn't believe the things that you say. Is she in hell? To say she didn't believe on Jesus Christ, she is. It's, it's truth, and there's no nice way to say that. You can cower back and say, well, it's not for me to decide. And you can say that, but really the, the fact is, if she didn't believe on Jesus Christ, she's still in her sins, and the wages of sin is death. And that's true. That's an offensive message, is it not? The message by itself is offensive, but it's not hard. And that's what I think we're scared of. And we come up with all of our excuses to say it. But ultimately, God gets glory through the proclamation. How many of you are glad somebody came along and wasn't, they weren't too scared to tell you? Heck yeah. <laughs> so, we need to be the kind of people who aren't too afraid. And there are other reasons why. Depends on how you tell a person, too. Yeah, and that's right. And we're not holding up signs, you're going to hell. Okay? But I'm going to lovingly say, if you remain in your sin, if you if, if you don't come to Christ, you hell is real. It is. Jesus warned of weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's not unkind. I like what Spurgeon said. If you ever preach on hell, it better be through tears. The idea is there needs to be compassion, not it's not for me to take hell and beat you over the head with it. It's to lovingly warn you. Listen, if your house were on fire and I knew you were in the house and I loved you and I knew you were asleep and you didn't know your house were on fire, what would you do? What would I do if I loved you? I'd beat down your door and come drag you out kicking and screaming. And you'd be like, why are you waking me up from my sleep? I was having a good dream. And I'm going to say, if you stayed in that house, you would die. And afterwards, they might not like the initial jolt, but afterwards, if they believed that they were in danger, and they believed what you said, and they loved what you did, then they would love you for telling them the truth. But we, we're like the person who says, man, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and the house is on fire. If I make on their door, I'm going to wake them up. That's rude. Do you hear? I mean, that's, that's, that's an illustration I often use, but it's an important one. So... I've just laid down the gauntlet here. I've just laid down this big responsibility that if, 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 you're, if, if you're where you need to be, you need to be holding this responsibility. So you should be asking yourself, where in my life am I not obeying the gospel? Then you need to ask that question. Or, or am I living my life for the proclamation of the gospel? Do, do I speak the name of Jesus and his work on the cross to those who don't believe I'm not, I don't want to say enough, because uh, what's enough? <laughs> I mean, what we sing songs like we're going to, for 10,000 years, sing his praises. I mean, what's enough? To, when, when have I done enough to tell people about Jesus that, hey, I, I did my Jesus stuff, now I can go on living. I, I, I don't know that there's an enough. So I want you to embrace the weight of that. Now I'm going to release the weight a little bit. And I want to say to you that as you begin embracing a life centered around reflection and proclamation of the gospel, let's go back to that thing. You need to, your first step after being saved by Jesus is now to be focused wholly on what Jesus saved you for. Why did he save you? Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible will you find that the exclusive reason why Jesus saved you is so that you won't go to hell. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. That the exclusive reason why Jesus saved you, actually, the fact that you don't go to hell is a great byproduct of what God was actually doing when he saved you. The Bible says he was actually reconciling you to himself. So he didn't save you from sin to nothing. He saved you from sin to himself. It's a salvation to somewhere if he saves you from something. Does that make sense? He's dragging you from something to something. Well, what's the from? From sin and death to life eternal with him. Jesus says this is life eternal, that they might know the true God. 
Eternal life is knowing God. So in other words, God is the central figure of why he's doing everything. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you to prove this point to you. Um, you stay where you are. I'm just going to read them to you. Let me start with Colossians chapter 1. That might be a good place. Just so you get a flavor for how the Bible talks. Um, Colossians chapter 1. Listen to this. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Listen to this. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and what? For him. All things were created for him. So where are all things? Do you fit in that category? Were you created? So you were created through him. Well, that makes sense. God made me. But you weren't just created by him. You were also created for him. But in that, in that, in that creation, we fell. We said, no, God, I'm not interested. I want to live for me. And that's rebellion, isn't it? That's what Adam did in the garden, right? So what did he do? Well, that separated God and man. So he sent his son, this text says, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And for, for in him, all the fullness, I just read that, <laughs> and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Making peace, what do you mean? Making peace. Well, if I separate from God, he's at war with me. So what does he do through the blood of, the, of Jesus' cross? He makes peace with me. How does he do it? You, once alienated, hostile in your mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled, brought back to himself in a loving relationship. He's fine. Uh, in, the, in the body of his flesh, by the death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Verse 18 is the one of verse I skipped. He is the head of the body of the church, and Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent. He might be, why did God save you? So that he might be preeminent. Making peace by the blood of his cross so he may take a hostile man and make him a glorifier, reconciling him to himself. But he did that for himself. That's an amazing statement. That when he saved me, he did it for him. But I'm glad he did it for him because now I get the benefit. And who gets the glory? I get the benefit and who gets the glory? God gets the glory. Let me give you another scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks like this. For the love of Christ constrains us. For Because we have concluded this, that one, that's Jesus, has died for all. That means all of every race, creed, color, that matter. Therefore all have died with him. And he died for all. So that, listen to this, it's a big deal. So that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So Jesus died and was raised for our sake, right? But why? For what reason? So that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for our sake. So there's a two point. He died for our sake. It's not wrong to say, right? But it's also not wrong to say that the primary sake, the primary cause that he died for us is so that we might live for him. So what we say then is God had ulterior motives in saving you. He wanted to take a rebel and create a glorifier. And in doing that, it's a win-win because God gets glory and you get joy. When I say glory, I don't mean Okay, let's say say something nice about God right now. Do it! I don't care what you're feeling, do it. Say That's not what I mean. Glory comes from the joy of saying what you love. If you love a sport, if you love a, a team, if you love a particular song, you love to share it with people. You love to declare the excellencies of that song or that movie or that book or that activity or whatever. You enjoy sharing in the glories of things. That's the natural output. If you hear a good song, you're like, man, I love that song. I love the part where he says this. Or, or I love that melody. Or what are you just doing? It's natural. And does any, do, do you... Do you get bummed out having to share with people why you love your favorite song? 
It is your complete and utter joy to do it, isn't it? So what God does is he takes a, a person who doesn't like God's laws, he doesn't like to do what God says, and he transforms him, regenerates him, makes him a new man, sets him on a rock, creates in him a heart that absolutely loves his laws and wants to keep his laws, and now he's gone from a rebel to a glorifier, and it's his complete joy to listen and obey to God, though he struggles in this life. There'll be a day we won't ever struggle anymore. There'll be a day. There'll be no fight, no more war, no more tears. Nothing will not ever struggle with sin again. Until then, we groan in our bodies, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. But it is my complete joy to obey Christ. If I could obey, if I were a complete obeyer, it would never be a drudgery. It would be the completion of what my heart longs for. Because I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for righteousness. Are you? Do you hunger for righteousness? And if you hunger for righteousness, what if you had that which you hungered for? You would be completely satisfied, fed up, content in what you have, because that's what you long for. So, why did God save you? He saved you for him. That means your life that he has redeemed unto himself means so much in him. That means it is a beautiful thing for you to, to display the glory of God to your friends who hate you or your enemies who hate you. Or people who wrong you. It is your absolute, absolute joy and, um, and and privilege to share the good news that Jesus is the exalted one for, uh, who died for sinners so that they might come to Christ. That should be our complete joy. And that's where God wants you to be in the rest of your life. So let's say here's point A. You get saved right here. In other words, you heard the gospel proclaimed. You're now saved at point A. Jesus has now at this moment begun a good work in you. And then you have the, my, the, the podium here is your lifespan. This is the day you die and you find, or the day Jesus returns and you finally get what you've been waiting for. The presence of God with a sinless body, complete resurrected body, everything you're longing and waiting for right now. But until then we hope. So what do you do from here to here? And the answer is you give your life to the reflection and the proclamation of Jesus. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means you begin looking at your life through the lens of the gospel. I said it last week, and I'll say it again this week. Do you have any broken relationships right now? People in your life where your relationship is strained and it's broken. What did God do when we were broken and our relationship was strained and I was his enemy? He came to me and he, through his own pain, sorrow, and death, made it so that there can be a renewal and a reconciliation. That doesn't mean that necessary. Well, I don't want to start saying what that does and doesn't mean because I don't want to let, let us off the hook because we tend to say, yeah, but you don't know that relationship and, and, and you don't know what happened. And I just want to, just let's just keep the gospel simple right now before we get into qualifiers and what, what we can and what God expects and doesn't. But let's just say that what Jesus did, it wasn't based upon any qualifiers, was it? He didn't look down and say, ah, you know, our relationship is strained, but it's not, they haven't gone over the line. That's not too bad. Because who can be saved? Can a murderer be saved? What about a rapist? We don't. Could Hitler be saved? Could he have been? Is he too far gone? I mean, is he not the epitome of evil in our minds? Or Jeffrey Dahmer? You all know that guy? I think he used to eat people. Mm -hmm. um, Ted Bundy, I think he was, I think, I don't know, it, serial killers, you know, evil, evil people. Yeah. So, are they beyond redemption? Is anybody, only those that go their entire living lives without acknowledging Jesus Christ and uh, turning from their sin and turning to Christ for redemption? Yes, they're too far gone. But that's the only criteria. So why do we treat our relationships that way? 
You see, God is actually offering you the opportunity to display the glories of the gospel. You know what's so beautiful? When you love unlovable people. And I know it's hard. I know it's painful. I know it's, it's impossible humanly. It doesn't even make sense humanly. The kind of advice I often give people in counseling to the average Joe, it's crazy. But was not the gospel crazy? Look at what God did. He came to an entire human race. Nobody wanted him. Light came into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And neither did men come to the light because they, their deeds would be exposed. But light shone in the darkness. And those who walk in the light can receive forgiveness of sin. But how did he, how did he ascertain forgiveness of sin for us? His own death. That means a gospel life is also a life of death. It's a living death. Paul said this, I die daily. Imagine, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, to go from town to town. He would enter into the synagogues. And you know who, was sitting, who were in synagogues? Jews. Jews were reading there. And you know Jews, who were the ones who killed Jesus? Romans did it, but who initiated it? The Jews did. So for him to walk into a synagogue and to begin preaching Christ would be to say, you need to renounce or move on now from this shadow of a picture of who Jesus is and recognize, embrace Jesus as the fulfillment of all you've been doing and put that old stuff away. That's what he expected them to do, right? And now to a Jew listening to a guy, now what if somebody came along and said, yeah, y'all need to put Jesus aside and embrace this new person because this is really the... How, I mean, that's just to give you a, a, a feeling or an emotion. How would you feel about such a person? Forget you. And in fact, you call them wackos. And if you were in a society that, where it was accepted, you would imprison them, shut them up, do whatever it took to get them out of your life. You call them heretics. And, and in Paul's culture, he would walk into a town and they would often stone him for his blasphemies. They would put him in prison to shut him up. They would beat him and flog him. So he's, let's just say now he's on a missionary journey, he's, and he sees off in the distance. There's, there's the, there's the um, city of Galatia, and I haven't been to that town yet. But I know what's going to happen there. And once I go in, Paul's thinking. Paul thinks, I know what's going to happen there. I'm going to go into there. I'm going to go to their synagogues, and I'm going to proclaim Jesus and Him crucified, and they're going to hate me. And they're going to kill me. And they're going to persecute me, or they're going to stone me. Here I go. What kind of death did that take? When Paul says, I die daily, that was what he meant. It took a living death. But if I tell my friend, and here's how it applies to us, if I tell my friend the truth of what God says, they might not like it. They may be mad at me. I may lose their friendship. Or if I forgive this person what they did for me, they, they may keep on doing it. Or they may never get the justice that they really deserve. Or they, you, you, you fill in the blank. But it's not our job to meet out justice. And it's not our job to even deal with the results that God's give, God gives us. Our job is to faithfully and joyfully and powerfully proclaim good news to, to sinners. But good news to sinners is only good news to a sinner who knows they're a sinner. Have you embraced a life that reflects the gospel? Have you embraced a life that proclaims the gospel? And so that's what I want you to begin thinking about now. Okay, Jim, I agree with you. I need to reflect and proclaim, but how do I do that? Because I don't right now. <laughs> okay, so here's what I say to people. Start taking steps in that direction. Start looking. Where's the, where's the most clear step that you can begin taking? Where's the most clear thing in your life right now, for instance, that mars the picture of the gospel, where you're not obeying. You're still remaining in sin. You've not relinquished to God. You've not said, okay, God, I'm going to obey you here because I know it's wrong and I've been doing it anyway. You, what is the most clear thing that you're remaining in rebellion against God for? What, what is it? 
take it. Let's start dealing with that right now. Just put all your emphasis and your mind in. This needs to be relinquished to God, and I need to joyfully obey Him. Or who is it that God has been nudging you to speak to? Or maybe you've not even thought of that at all. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't walk through life thinking, hey, there's a person who needs Jesus. I walk into a grocery store sometimes, and I'm looking around. And I'm like, I, I remember on Easter two years ago or three years ago, I walked into the grocery store. Easter Sunday, I'm getting ready to preach, and I'm thinking, here's a lady stocking shelves, and all of a sudden my heart was broken for that lady. I didn't know where she's going. I don't know if she knew Jesus or not, but I'm just thinking she might not know him. And here it is, Easter Sunday morning, I'm thinking of the resurrection of Jesus, and she's stuck in a shelf. And I'm just, my heart was broken for the possibility that she might not know Christ. And if she doesn't know Christ, she's on her way to hell. And she's not giving him the glory that he deserves. And there's so much involved. My heart was broken. Maybe you don't look through the world. So maybe you just need to start walking around maybe campus and saying, I wonder if my friends even know Jesus. Maybe you need to, you know, maybe your family or maybe your friends that you hang out with, do they even know Jesus? And start, maybe, let's start taking some steps here. So what are some steps? What are some baby steps you can start taking? Well, before you even talk to anybody, now, I want to think of two areas of life here. So I want you to envision two tracks that are running parallel. Then we're going to call that, that the, 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 the Christian life. This is a railroad track. And there's two parallel tracks going down. One track is the reflection of the gospel. One track is the proclamation of the gospel. And to be really, uh, you know, we want both of them to be in line. So, but I want you to think of, of, of two roads here or two tracks. And so we want to start taking steps in the reflection of the gospel. So uh, you need to start looking at relationships. You need to start looking at your own obedience to God's commands. Does your life reflect the gospel? Do you obey the cross? Do you obey Jesus? Are there, are, are there issues in your life that you're still walking in rebellion in? Because what did Jesus say? He said, remember the woman who was caught in adultery? And, and, and I bring this up all the time, but it's very, very important. Or even how, let me choose a different illustration. There were some, uh, there were some uh, people who had leprosy. They came to Jesus. He healed them. And then he said to them, now go and stop sinning unless something worse happened to you. What does he mean? I'm going to heal you. I'm a healer. I'm one who makes whole what is sick and broken. I take broken and sick things and I mend them. Because that's who I am. That's a picture of the life that I give. But the, when I give life, I expect life. What kind of life did he expect? Go turn from your rebellion. He told the woman, uh, uh, he told the woman at the well, uh, uh, he says, uh, Oh, I forget what he asked her about husbands. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have five. And the one you're living with makes your husband. Well, why would he mention this? He's pointing it out that this is not good. This is wrong. And she took that information. She goes back home and she says, come here, man, that told me everything I ever did. And she, you, you better believe she turned from that sin. There was a woman who was a prostitute. And uh, Jesus had obviously, had obviously had an interaction with her and, uh, and, and brought forgiveness and redemption of her sins. And uh, she goes in, she barges in on a meal he's having with a, a Pharisee named Peter, uh, or Simon, I should say. And uh, I think it's Simon. Correct me if I'm wrong. I can't remember now. Is it my, is it Simon? Anyway, detail doesn't matter. He's a Pharisee. I think it's Simon. Uh, Peter, I can't, I'm confused now. It doesn't matter. Point is, here this woman takes, uh, takes her hair. She's weeping over what Christ has done for her. And she's weeping over, over him. And, and she's washing his feet with her hair. In other words, here's this woman that has been had an encounter with Christ that's produced some transformation and worship here. The gospel is good news, but it doesn't now say, so go and sin all you want. The gospel demands I have freed you from that sin. Now go and obey. I freed you in order to obey. And so my point is that maybe you need to start. You need to start looking at your life and, and asking the question: What in my life is deficient with God's clear commands? What is God in my in my spirit? What does He put? His finger on, you know, I'll bet you. And I've not really preached about any particular sin today. I'm just talking in general, right? But let me ask you a question. 
And you don't have to answer this with a hand, but you can if you want. If you're like me, when I listen to a sermon and the guy's talking about sin in general, I know that always in my mind, I'm not thinking sin in general. I'm thinking one sin or two sins that God's dealing with in my life. Is that like you? Any of you? I'm not even talking about any particular sin. I just talk about sin and walking in obedience. And God, the Holy Spirit, is like, yeah, that one. <laughs> that one. And he deals with it. And so you... And the Holy Spirit is now saying, it's time to deal with it. It's time to walk in obedience so that you might be. So as you begin putting that sin off, gaining victory in your life, uh, gospel victory over this willful rebellion in this particular area, you are declaring to the world, I love Jesus more than that thing. This, this thing that gives me pleasure. Or this, this you, you might be, you might, the sin God may be dealing with you is bitterness, for instance. And it gives you joy. To be honest with you, bitterness brings me joy. Because it, think about it. And, and I'm, I, I like to get to the, I like to, when I'm a counselor, you should, you should be in my counseling session sometimes. But sometimes I just say really, really blunt things. Because, because it's the truth. Why do we remain in bitterness? Because it makes me feel good. Because I was the right one. Very well. You see what I meant by, it, it, it's not joy so much, but it, it does justify. It, it, and, and maybe I'm living there because I feel like it's my way of meeting out justice to them. They deserve what they deserve, and I'm meeting out that justice. But really, God says, no, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Now, what if it's a Christian brother or sister that's done something to you? And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. How did he do that? He did it on the cross, did he not? He meted out all the justice and all the wrath that was deserved for the sin that was committed against you. He did it in Jesus. So that's why we must forgive brothers and sisters because God has. That's just an example, okay? It's dangerous to bring examples because that limits you to what I'm thinking. I'm thinking uh, of whatever it is that doesn't glorify God in your life, God is putting his finger upon it. I want you to start taking a step in obedience to that. Start waging war against it in your life. Because that's what the gospel is intended to do. That other track is proclamation. You say, well, Jim, I, 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 I never shared the gospel with anybody boldly like you're talking about. But here's a, a baby step you might take. Why don't you start thinking of a person... Think of the person in your life who you know, who you think God couldn't possibly save. You know what I mean? They'll never get saved. that person. Why don't you start praying for that? And I'm not just talking about filling a 30 second prayer out every now and then. I'm talking about devoting the next month to consistent, hard labor and prayer. As many times and as much as you can in a day. Start thinking gospel thoughts about them. Start praying for them. That's, that's a simple step. Does it require anything, any talking to any person but to God? Because isn't God the one who saves? Isn't God the one who draws? Isn't God the one who does the work of salvation? That's a baby step. Start thinking about gospel proclamation in your life. Now, over the next several weeks, I'm going to actually deal with each leg of that, of that track. And we're going to talk about the growth that happens in the baby steps. Today, for the purpose of, of this, I want you just to begin thinking about taking steps in obedience to the gospel in its reflection and its proclamation. And begin thinking, okay, God, here I am. I, I heard Jim. I want to proclaim your gospel because that's how you get glory. I love Romans chapter 1, verse what is it, 15. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save those that believe. You realize when you say Jesus died for your sins, that's the power of God on your lips. You need no magic words. You need no sophisticated scientific answers to prove it. Because salvation is of the Lord and it happens when the Holy Spirit regenerates a person. So for the remaining couple of minutes, you're in Ezekiel chapter 37. And I want 36 and 37, I want to show you something. Ezekiel 30, all of that was the introduction. I'm not preaching any longer except this text. Ezekiel 36. 
count how many I wills you see in this text, starting with verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. What's God concerned about right now? Israel or the holiness of his name? The holy. He says, it's not for your sake that I'm about to act. Now, the question is, what's he about to do? We'll get to that in verse 24 in a minute. But he says, whatever he's about to do, it's going to be a vindication of his name. It's going to be a vindication of his glory and, his, and the holiness of his name. He's going to correct the profaning of Israel and turn them some ways. He says, I'm going to vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord. When through you I vindicate my holiness before his eyes. Now, how is he going to vindicate the holiness of his name? Answer, through you. Here's how he'll do it. Verse 24. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and I will bring you into your land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. From all of your uncleannesses and from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to obey my rules. I will take you and bring you unto myself. I will clean you. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to obey my rules. And you'll be careful to do them. This is a picture of salvation, is it not? This is a picture of what God is doing when he saves a person. He takes you out of the world and he brings you unto himself. He cleans all of your filthiness and all of your eyes by the blood of Jesus. And then he begins to put, he puts his spirit within you and he begins to cause you to walk in his statutes so that you might be careful to obey his rules. How does he do it? For chapter 37 of Ezekiel. How does he do it? The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and was full of bones. So what's Ezekiel seeing? This big valley, and a bunch of dead man's bones all over the place. And he led me around, and this is God, the Lord, leading him around among them. And behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry bones. So these are bones that are deader than dead. They're like... They're, like, they're dry. That means they're, you touched it, it would probably crumble. You know, like when you see the mummies and they grab the hand and it just kind of crumbles off. You know, that's the picture I'm getting. Here. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Why are you asking me? He says. <laughs> that, that's my rendition of verse 3. And I said, Lord God, you know. Why are you asking me? You know. Can these bones live? Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these dry bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you. And I will cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So, Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. The flesh had come upon them. The skin had covered them. And there was no breath, uh, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe on these slain that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost, and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Here's a picture of God saying, Dead are going to raise, rise, rise again. But how does how does life come upon these dead men's bones? The word of the Lord is spoken to them. I'll leave you with John six sixty three. The flesh is no help at all. The spirit gives life. And the words that I have spoken unto you, they are spirit. They are life. Do you realize that the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to take a dead man and give him spiritual life in Christ by the Holy Spirit? So that should empower you to open your mouth and prophesy to the bones. You got some people who are dead, you say they never accept Jesus. That's the dead man's bones. What does, Jesus, what does God say? Go prophesy to the dead bones. Go proclaim the word of God to them. We need to be people who reflect the gospel in our life, but people who proclaim the gospel in our relationships with people that God's given us. So what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks is look at, well, how do you build your relationships with such people so that the gospel might be proclaimed? Are there some practical steps that I can begin taking with people in my life that would begin to move me in a direction where I might proclaim in a very natural way what Jesus has done in my life and what Jesus can do in yours. Yes, there are several very practical things. So the rest of the next several weeks are going to be talking about just taking practical steps in your life and seeing how my God might begin to grow you in your proclamation and in your reflection of the gospel. Okay? That's where we're headed. Okay, I'm done. What say you? So, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. That's right. Is it scary? Is this the kind of sermon that says, man, I know my next week because he's going to tell me I don't do this stuff. <laughs> no, it is scary. It's terrifying. It's something like that. I think it was like the second week that me and Jeff were coming here and I was at work. It was like that Monday. And this really nice man, all these people work there like years and years and years at Kawasaki. And this man hit a semi that morning on his way to work. And he was fine. He was actually at church while we all were hearing about what happened to him. He went right to the church and talked to a preacher saying he got out of the hospital. But everyone was bawling and crying all day. And I've never felt like, and it's this one lady who was crying. She really, really cared about this guy. All day long, the guys are around with their little buddies getting parts for the factory. Um, I never see her anywhere, but for some reason, every time I looked around a corner or drove somewhere, she was right there in front of me crying all day long. And all I wanted to do was talk to her and you know ask her to come to church with me. And I just couldn't do it. And every bone in my body just wanted to talk to her and you know ask her to come and tell her that it's okay. God's here for you. Who's so called that? I, I, I want to pray with her. Yeah, it was fun. So every one of them just said they felt that way too. Yeah. It's How many of you have ever felt that way and then got over it and, and just were obedient? Anybody? Has that ever happened? Do you, do you ever regret it? I regret it still. Just talk about it. Regret not talking to her? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh. There is no condemnation. But, but that being said, is that's God saying, okay, you can't change that, can you? But you can change. begin taking steps in the future. Right? And so, um, absolutely. What else? Good. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, nothing I don't I feel myself. It's scary to stand up here and say something I have to say. Because a lot of times I'll say stuff and then the next week people don't show up again. You know, it's hard. That's it's really hard to deal with. You know, because I told you the truth and you, and you didn't like it. Or maybe it was, it was too much for you a while and you needed it in doses. I don't know. Uh, what, but the point is that 
It's hard sometimes uh, to say, tell people the truth. Even if your heart is completely, um, you're telling them in love. It, it's still very difficult. So I totally get the fear. But hearing a message like this, has anybody felt empowered a little? Is it, do you feel emboldened a little bit? Or do you just feel that? It's a reminder that um, it's the Spirit of God that does it. That we, we just speak the words of God and, and He brings the flesh on and He puts the Spirit in. It's so a reminder that in prayer for, for people and, and just speak the simple gospel message to them. And since coming here, me and Jeff, I didn't know about growth. I was like, then we were very new at coming here and learning about it and speaking about it. But now, even Jeff with his brothers and things like that, he he talks to them about it and he tells them what we learned here. And it's easier for us now that we've been coming and we've been reading more and understanding more. I think with time comes more power. And very good. That's something I want to keep communicating. That you're going to, as you grow in your knowledge, you're going to grow in more boldness because you're going to know, you feel more confident in what you know. Um, and you'll be more equipped to answer different questions. But for yeah. now, you know, I want to say that don't think you have to have so much knowledge in order to be able to share. You're only responsible for what God's given you. Be faithful and little. Faithful and little. Go ahead and finish it. Uh, and, then, and then you'll be faithful in much as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the steps you need to be taking is, again, faithfulness to this gathering. Not because, hey, I'm at church and God's happy with me now. Woo -hoo. But rather, it's through this gathering that God is equipping you so that you might be a greater reflector and proclaimer of the, of the gospel. Because I share the gospel every week. Do I not? I mean, every week. The work of Jesus is proclaimed. And so, but every week I, I, I may say some of the same words, but I say different words as well. And I bring it from a different text. And, and we find different ways to say the same thing, hopefully. So that through that through that variety, we understand what's going on at the cross all the more. What else? Who else? How do you respond to such a sermon? Hey. I thought it was really helpful how you explain the reflection and the proclamation, how they both go together. And um, I don't know, I guess, like, God just showed me, like, so many areas where I'm not, like, reflecting in. And so it's cool to be able, to, I like how you ask the question so we can, like, search ourselves or whatever, because then things get, like, pointed out and um, we can remember that or whatever as we go like okay these are the things that god wants me to work on or he's gonna work on it. we're gonna work on it together or whatever yeah anyway before we get out i was just talking to andrew uh this past friday about the reflection proclamation and the relationship there I do also like the parallel illustration that um, I was just telling him about uh, uh, coming to uh, we were also talking about the panel discussion I didn't go that he was talking about some of the, the comments that were shared there it's, it's that reflection that puts you in a position to proclaim uh, to proclaim with somebody who doesn't know That's right. You ever heard, so I don't listen to Christians because they don't live what they say. We you know, call them hypocrites, you know. Um, that's why it's super important that what we say matches what we do. Or what we do matches what we say. It's a big deal. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be perfect to come to church because I also you know, come gather with the church because I say, hey, listen, this is why. Uh, I mean, we're all hypocrites, so to speak. We all want what we're not. We wrestle with it. Uh, sin in our life, but we don't come here thinking we've got it together. We come here because we don't have it together. So that's want to maintain that that balance in our thoughts. That we never we never measure up, so to speak. Christ measured up on our behalf. That's good news. But on the other hand, we want to be the kind of humble people who acknowledge faults and, and don't condemn others in their faults, but rather exhort. That doesn't mean I don't exhort you to move on. Hey, listen, this is wrong, and, I, and it's wrong in my life too. So I mean, it doesn't mean 
I'm living in that wrongness, but I've already acknowledged that this is wrong, and I'm waging war against that in my life. Wage war with me against sin. So it, it's basically, I'm, I'm a broken pastor, um, sound like a broken record, um, proclaiming to broken people. It, it's just a whole beautifully broken system. And why does God do it that way? So that he gets more than me. I, I, mean, I can't take any credit for anything. And God meant it this way. So that there's no question about who's the centerpiece here. It ain't this dirt pot. We have this treasure in jars of clay and dirt pots. That's what he, uh, what one preacher said, crack pots. Which is a bunch of crack pots. So, all right. We're going to rescue him from, from his grandchildren. Children. And take me. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Continue to shape us by it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.